Logan, you're back online. Okay, great. Okay, we'll start now. Um, hello and welcome everyone uh, to the first in a series of webinars. Salinas will be running on chemical solutions for geothermal power generation. My name is Andrew Dine and I'm a member of the Salinas team responsible for the development of our geothermal power technology portfolio. In my spare time, I'm also the commercial lead for Salinas operations in New Zealand. I want to thank you all for attending and investing some of your valuable time today to learn more about developments for addressing key challenges in this important and growing industry. Next slide. First of all, some housekeeping. Today's seminar will include a 40 minute presentation followed by 15 minutes of questions and answers. Can I please ask everyone to ensure their microphones are muted and remain muted during the presentation? As indicated, we will have a Q&A session today and we ask that all questions be held until the end of the presentation. Your questions should be submitted by the meeting chat function only, please. If we're not able to get to your questions today, we will provide contact details at the end of the presentation for questions to be submitted post the seminar. Finally, today's seminar will be recorded and the recording will be available for consumption at your convenience on salinas.com within the next 24 hours. Next slide. Uh, before getting started with today's seminar presentation, a very quick introduction to Salinas. Salinas is a global specialty chemical company that has been adding value to both consumer and industrial markets for over 100 years through its various legacy organisations, which include the likes of Drew Industrial, Betz Laboratories, Hercules, Stockhausen, Ashton Water Technologies, and most recently BASF Paper and Water Division. We are very proud to be leaders in our strategic markets and operate globally in 120 countries, employ some 5,000 people, and produce our technologies from 41 manufacturing plants across five continents. Our reason for existing is to solve tough water treatment and process improvement challenges through the core elements of people, experience, and technology. And by doing so, help our customers meet their operational and sustainability goals. The geothermal power industry is a strategic market for Salinas. And over the last three years, we have carried out extensive voice of customer research and invested over two and a half million US dollars in research and development to develop solutions to the problems and the challenges highlighted by this industry. As a result, we have de developed and more importantly validated a portfolio of novel and industry leading technologies that we are really excited to be introducing through this webinar series. Next slide. I'd now like to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Logan Muller. Logan Muller has 19 years of experience in the geothermal industry and has provided sustainability consulting services to leading companies around the world for more than 30 years. For the past three years, Logan has led the geothermal research and development efforts at Salinas, focusing on developing novel chemical and digital technologies to address scale and corrosion challenges. He is credited for recently developing geothermal well cleaning techniques that has helped geothermal power producers generate millions of dollars in profit by improving productivity in both production and reinjection wells. Logan has an undergraduate qualification in water science and hydrology engineering, a master's degree in industrial, in, sorry, in an international business, and a doctorate in sustainable practices. Logan, please proceed with today's presentation. Hey, thanks, Andrew, and uh, welcome everybody. It's, uh, it's certainly a pleasure to to be here today and to be able to communicate a significant step forward in technology for the geothermal industry. Um, you know, I began in geothermal 39 years ago, and uh, in that 39 years, I have seen reoccurring issues 
uh, that have challenged the industry in all of the 26 countries I have worked in that use geothermal technology. So it's with great, uh, with great pleasure that I can communicate some of these breakthroughs in R&D and technology with you today. Uh, one of our partners that we have been developing these technologies with, a, a, a long-standing geothermal industry, uh, has saved over $60 million because they have been able to apply these technologies to their company. So uh, it really is with great pleasure that I'm, I'm here with you today. The structure of today, I'm going to go over uh, some basic uh, introductory uh, technologies, a little bit of a background of how we get scaling, specifically silica scaling in our systems. We are able to point out some of the flaws or some of the errors that have been made in the production and development of chemicals to prevent silica uh, scaling. And I'm sure you can all relate to these that have tried many different techniques, but unsuccessfully. So thanks to the work and the investment from Selenus, we were able to solve some of these issues and we'll be covering that today. So let's get into it. The introduction, this is not unusual for you. Uh, every geothermal well is different. The temperature profiles are different. The geology is different. The types of dissolved minerals in the brine are different. These can change from the types of minerals to the concentrations varying from 100 grams per tonne to 250,000 grams per tonne. So every geothermal application is different. Some of the common geothermal scales we see are silica and calcite, but of course there are also metal sulfides, there are metal oxides, mag silicate, um, corrosion, gypsum, barite. And in fact, if you have a high enthalpy well, you can get nearly every mineral in the brine depositing in your production formation if you have flashing. So today we're going to be focusing on silica. Uh, this is a publicly available graph on the on the internet and is from uh, is from Contact Energy in New Zealand. It is their Ohaki field. When it was first drilled, it was producing 106 megawatts. And due to some reservoir issues and a lot of silica scaling, that plant now is producing about 32 megawatts. So that is a 70 megawatt reduction in its capability solely because, or predominantly because, should I say, the impact of silica. And what we can see, you'll see this graph on the right hand side here, this capacity decline, the, sh the shoulder of decline I'll talk about a lot. Many of your plants may be continuing well with not a lot of change in the production for several years and then suddenly silica seems to be a problem. Now this is a common phenomenon that I've seen in many different countries. So what we'll be talking about today is is how we can recover the capacity of your reinjection systems and your reinjection lines and also how the same new technology can apply to stimulating production wells. So where do we see silica scales? We see it in binary plants. So this is right at the front end of a system where we have brines passing through exchanges. We see it in separators and we see it in reinjection pipelines, which is that, that uh, photograph to the right. Why do we get silica? Well, it, um, it comes about from two things predominantly, changes in concentration, changes in pH, and also change in temperature. Silica is less soluble at lower, lower temperatures. So let's go on now and talk a little bit about silica deposition. Uh, I know a lot of you know this already, so I will not be spending a lot of time on it, but I will, I have put the slides in here so you can refer back to it for your reference. Of course, 
2,000 metres under the ground at great pressure and temperature, quartz goes into an equilibrium solution with the brine in the reservoir. So that forms silicic acid. And when it's under pressure and at constant temperature, it stays in equilibrium. However, we come along, we drill a hole, we take the uh, heat and the brine and the vapour out of the reservoir, and by doing so, we change two things. We change the temperature, and also we change the pH and concentrations as the two-phase steam forms. So this basically brings about the formation of these silicic acid monomers starting to form and polymerize to form what we know now as polymeric silica. So as the pH, as the pH rises, the solubility increases, and as the temperature decreases, the solubility decreases. So of course, in our systems, what are we doing? We're taking heat out. That means that we're lowering the, the uh, solubility of the silica. And also, as we concentrate the silica by taking a vapor portion off of the brine, we are concentrating it, increasing the saturation index. So how then do we get this in our systems? There's three steps. The first step is nucleation. So this is where two silicic acid ions join together to form very small colloids, nucleation. This is the nuclei of the silica that then goes on to, to polymerize and form small nuclei that begin a polymerization chain. Now, it's interesting that this first step is actually catalyzed by hydroxide ions. Note that hydroxide ions are not consumed in the nucleation process, but they do catalyze the hydrolyzation of the silicic acid ions. We measure this ability of these ions to, to nucleate by measuring the um, SSI, the silica, the silica saturation index. The higher this is, the more nucleation we get. Once we have the small nuclei formed and they're beginning to pop polymerize, they then start to ripen and form the, the larger colloids as we, as we see here in this picture, and we call this Ostwald ripening. Now, this is the process that forms the scales that sticks to our pipework in our, in our binary plants and also in the reinjection wells and in the formation. Once this deposit forms in the formation, we start losing permeability and hence our, our reinjection capability. So it's important to note though that um, this, what, this, this potential to form or nucleate is measured by what we call the SSI. Now this is a log scale. So you can see that it's exponentially affected by temperature, by pH, and also by concentration or saturation. The higher the SSI, the more nucleation that, that, that happens. This can affect the rate of deposition, although the rate of deposition is also dependent on temperature, so it will happen more faster at a higher temperature than it will at a lower temperature. But it also determines the amount of deposit that can form. The other thing to take into account here is what has been a major breakthrough from, from my team in, at the R&D lab in Wilmington. And what we found is that this initial nucleation has an activation energy. So we can have an SSI of higher than 1, 1.1 or 1.2, and we will not get the polymerization effect of the amorphous silica. Now, up until very recently, and I'm talking about the last year or so, many companies do polymerization studies to determine what amount of time they have once the SSI is exceeded before the polymerization will actually start the Ostwald ripening process and form scales in the pipeline. 
So this has been a common practice until now. But what we've discovered is that once silicates form, this activation energy is bypassed. So the polymerization time that we have been relying on in our calculations in the past becomes irrelevant. And you'll see this in nearly every single plant in, in the world. What we are finding now is that the silicates, they will form quantitatively with any aluminium in the brine. Now, I had a conversation with uh, some plant owners in Southeast Asia last, last week, and they said, oh, but we don't have any aluminium. And I said, well, do you measure it? And they said, well, we don't need to. We never have. What we've discovered is that aluminium, even at 0 0.05 milligrams per litre, 0 0.05 parts per million, will react with, with silica prior to a saturation of one and form aluminosilicates. Now, it's not only silica. That there's not only aluminium that does this, we have found the same thing happens with manganese, with iron, in fact, with many different cations. Now, this is part of the equation that has been uh, missed in the calculation of silica. It's, it's been a major breakthrough in, for two reasons. First, in the inhibition of forming silica in your system, so inhibitors that do not prevent the silicates seeding and catalyzing the polymerization will not work to prevent polymerization. And in the second part, which has been our major breakthrough, is once the silica is, is formed and it deposits, how can we remove it? It's been a key breakthrough in how we remove it, which I'll, I'll carry on and explain later. So where do we get it? Well, we get it here in the reinjection well. We've seen that. That's easy. We can use an air hammer or a mechanical way of removing that. Some people have put drilling rigs over this in the past and drilled out these deposits here. Um, more recently, Contact Energy in particular has developed a, a very efficient air hammer process using a coil tubing unit that can very easily and efficiently remove silica from the well bore. However, when the silica forms in the cracks and fissures in the formation, this cannot be removed mechanically. And up until now, the only way of removing this has been using very dangerous chemicals like hydrofluoric acid, or you may know it as mud acid, 5% HF, 10% HCl. But this too has proven to be risky, expensive, and rather ineffective. We will be doing some comparisons of this later on. So here is the beautiful silica. Um, it has, uh, it's a beautiful substance, but it also really works against us. Not only does it restrict flow in the pipeline by decreasing its diameter or block fractures and fissures in the formation, but the way the crystals grow is they grow into the flow. So these crystals here are growing into the flow. The flow in this picture is coming towards us. So therefore, the, the effect of friction on the flow is very significant. And here it is a little closer. So what I'm going to discuss now is I'm going to cover some very common uh, techniques that the industry has used to try and mitigate or reduce silica deposition. And I'm also going to cover some of their problems because I know I, I talk to people in Indonesia or in Philippines or in Guatemala in, in Mexico, in California, in Turkey, in Iceland, or in, um, in Italy, and many of them are considering to use some of these techniques. So I do want to cover some of these in case these are things that you have considered, and you may, and if you have, you may have experienced some of the downside of these. So let's cover these very briefly. One is using acid to delay polymerization. The other is the use of caustic. 
the third calling the reinjection fluid and finally I'll, I'll talk about some of the new developments let's look at acid now so remember how i said at the beginning the the initial nucleation is actually uh, catalyzed by the hydroxide ion now if it's catalyzed by the hydroxide ion which it is and i if you look back on one of those earlier slides i referred to dr kevin brown now kevin brown is probably one of the world's most proficient uh, researchers and the most the most knowledgeable on silica and he has a number of publications in which he talks about this at length so feel free to search kevin brown from new zealand to understand some of these uh, mechanisms if you don't already so the theory behind acidification is that if we can remove hydroxide from the brine then we are removing one of the uh, one of the ions that will catalyze the nucleation but it's important to understand here that it does not it does not stop polymerization but it just delays it so the rationale behind this is if we dose acid we will be able to uh, reduce or increase the time that we have before the silica starts forming but i want you to look at this curve here this is a basic uh, curve that we learn in high school it's a it's a strong acid weak base titration you have a, a certain amount of acid that needs to go into overcoming the buffering effect once the buffering effect uh, is over you have a very steep curve here between the amount of acid dosed and the ph now if you dose too much you get a very low ph and will corrode your pipes if you don't dose enough you won't stop the silica polymerization and this is an actual graph taken from some brines in the central north island region of new zealand where they found that they needed a ph below five to slow down the polymerization but as you can see by this graph here if there's not quite enough acid there is no hindrance at all if there is too much acid it drops very rapidly which means that unless the control of the acid is perfect you ch you run the risk of either corroding the pipework or not achieving what you want to achieve now this the acid that's normally used is sulfuric acid because it's very it's cheap but if over time you keep dosing it what we have found in new zealand in some of the eastern uh, shores of the north island geothermal region is that it actually changes the reservoir ph and over time we start seeing an increase in sulfates and calcium coming up through our production wells so the other thing that happens is of course as the as the uh, acid gets neutralized by the formation and the ph goes up what happens all of the silica redeposits and what we have found in some of the uh, larger plants in new zealand now is that over the last 10 years all they have managed to do is transfer the silica deposition further out into the reservoir and now it's becoming a problem that's the certification let's now look at caustic now as we as we discussed earlier on that caustic at ph9 it becomes quite soluble so if we look at the log k1 of the silicic acid uh, uh, hydrolyzation we see that log k1 is 8.96 log k2 is 11. so therefore at ph9 the solubility of silica be starts to increase exponentially some people with quite a high ph brine have elected to try and add caustic to this so that the silica does not deposit and of course one thing i want to point out here and i'll be coming back to this log k2 is 11 so therefore at p at ph 11 silica will come uh, will move from the solid phase into the liquid phase so it will redissolve some of the challenges caustic is not cheap compared to acid 
It does lead to a lot of precipitation or co-precipitation of other deposits, calcium, barium, iron, for example, and will um, change the pH of the reservoir if used consistently. The third method is to call the reinjection fluid. Well, how does this work? Well, two reasons. One is if we call the water, the water becomes heavier, it becomes more dense. And that means that the weight of the water, if you have a two kilometer or 2000 meter deep uh, reinjection well, that added density will, will basically create a higher reinjection pressure for you. The second mechanism is, as we know, because of thermal expansion, that the, the fissures and cracks in the, uh, in the formation will open up as the formation contracts. So if we do a couple, if we look at a couple of these uh, phenomenon here, we can see that just from the increase in density, a 65 degree temperature brine, if we drop that temperature by 10 degrees, it increases the density by about seven kilograms per cubic meter. Now that over 2000 meters is 1.4 bar. So by lowering the temperature, you artificially create a higher reinjection pressure. The impact now of formation on the formation is if you look at the coefficient of expansion and compare granite to iron. Now we know iron and steel has quite a high coefficient of expansion with temperature. It means that the granite being similar to iron as we cool, as we cool down or lower the temperature of the formation, these cracks and fissures that you can see in this picture here actually open up. So a very small increase in thousands of fissures or cracks in the formation will make the formation more permeable. However, what is the downside? Well, as we know, the lower the temperature, the higher the SSI. The higher the SSI, the higher quantity of silica will eventually deposit. So if you're unable to get the silica back into the hot part of the formation, you will end up over time depositing more silica than if you hadn't uh, decreased the, the temperature. So I've seen this happen in Iceland. They cooled it down, they tried this, and after two or three years, their problem was worse because they had more silica in the formation blocking the reinjection uh, wells, and they were unable to clean it in that time because it was in the formation. Let's have a look at some of these new developments. Now, if we look at the new development of inhibitors, the key discovery here is that sol uh, only slowing down the polymerization using chemicals to delay polymerization or that second step of the of the deposit formation doesn't work. And I've run many trials using silica inhibitors in many countries around the world, and it has an effect, yes, but does it solve it and does it stop it? No. And why we have found that is that be, if you are getting silicates forming, that these silicates, these very, very fine deposits or solids that are formed in the brine, bypass the activation energy of the nucleation process, and it renders the chemical much less, effect, much less effective. So successful treatments for silica must stop Firstly, the metal silicates forming, and secondly, the polymerization process of the nuclei. Um, another new development I'm going to touch on very briefly now is, a, is an analyzer, I'll go on to that very, um, uh, in the next slide, that rather than run a trial and wait eight months before you can measure the results, you can use an online silica meter to know over the space of days or, or weeks if you are if you are actually slowing the polymerization or silica deposition problem. And lastly, which is going to be the second half of this uh, uh, webinar today, is using that basic 
chemistry information about silica where the K2 of dissociation or the constant of dissociation is 11, how we are now using step one on the slide and this last fact about silica deposition to actually remove the silica from your systems. Here is the OnGuard 3S analyzer that I was referring to. Um, it, is, it is basically a ultrasonic, and this ultrasonic here sends a signal out, measures what is depositing on the small plate here, if you look at my cursor, and it will give you a live and um, real-time measurement of the, of the silica deposition. I'm going to refer to this picture on the left hand side, which is actually a, a pipe, a uh, picture of a pipe taken out at the Ohaki field at contact on at contact energy. Now, if we look at this pipe, when you only have maybe 20 or 50 millimeters of deposit, the flow does not be is not affected very much. And so it can't be, it isn't really noticed. But once this deposit starts to get past one third a large and quick decline in, in capacity is noticed. So if we can measure that deposition with a machine beforehand, we will get plenty of warning on what is actually happening in, uh, in, the, uh, in our systems. So that brings me now to how we can stimulate or clean our reinjection systems. And I will talk about cleaning the production wells as well using the similar technique, but for now I'm going to focus on reinjection. As I mentioned before, if you relate it back to that picture of that pipe from uh, from Ohaki, you'll see that whilst the deposits are forming in the outer 20% of the diameter of the pipe, there's only a very small decline noticed. But between 20 and 40% of deposition, we see a rapid decline, and we call this the shoulder of decline. And this is usually when I get phone calls from people going, Logan, can you help us? We're losing capacity really quickly. You know, we've been running well for four years, but in the last six months, we've lost 20% capacity. And this is the reason why you may see that in your plants. So how did we use to clean it? What is the methods that you have currently? Well, it's either using a, a drill, a mechanical drill to clean out the uh, well bore. And if the deposit is in the formation, which it most probably is if you have it in the well bore, there is no method other than taking the well offline and adding something like hydrofluoric acid. Now, every account that I have seen of wells that have been cleaned by hydrofluoric acid follow this pattern. They start off with a good well, a few years go by, they lose capacity quickly, they panic, they bring in coil tubing units and mud acid, and they try and recover the capacity of the well, but it never recovers 100%. So they lose this capacity here, and then after a few years, it happens again. So what we've developed is a way of injecting very small amounts of chemical into the reinjection system over the period of only two days. Now, this does not take months or weeks or years to do. The process takes two days. And what we are doing is we are injecting while the well is in operation. It doesn't impact on the flow. It doesn't impact on your production. And we do small mini cleans using the online system. So that means that this area of the graph here is extra dollars of production for you. Now, we've done some really good studies with one of our partners, Contact Energy, and what they have calculated is that this increase in power production and capacity that they get more than 10 times pays for the cost of the clean. And these systems are kept at basically 100% capacity. Let's look at another uh, characteristic of online cleans. Now, I gather everybody on this call 
uh, has a lot of experience in geothermal. We understand basic concepts of flow and pressure. Now, if we take a well offline, and let's just say for argument's sake, it is a 300 ton per hour reinjection well, and we put down a coil tubing unit, and we pump down some chemicals to try and clean it. Really, we're going to be talking about 50 cubic meters or one sixth of the flow that the well is used to getting. So where is that fluid going to go? It's going to go to the lines of least resistance. It's going to be pumped into these big cracks and fissures into in the formation only. So by using the full capacity of the well under full flow while it's online, using the temperature of the brine, if we inject small amounts of chemicals, we not only clean these larger fractures, but we force it into all of these tiny small fractures of the formation, which are tens of thousands in number. So the online method needs much lower concentrations of chemicals. It doesn't need as much time and it is forced into every single crack and fissure that is receiving re-injected re brine. So in the online system, we get full penetration into the, into the geothermal system and Thermal Clean Limited and, and Contact and Salinas have developed a way of uh, stimulating a dead well to bring it back to life that we can that we can use these techniques on. Let's start talking about that now. I'm now going to talk about what is what is the online process and how we do it. So Selenus, Thermal Clean Limited in New Zealand and Contact Energy formed a partnership to really understand what is the phenomenon happening here. Now, for those of you who do not know Contact Energy, they are the longest producing geothermal uh, power provider in the world. They started back in the late 1950s and that original plant is still there. So anything that can go wrong or, or is possible to go wrong in geothermal, <laughs> Contact Energy have, uh, have experienced it. So they have dedicated some of their top reservoir engineers uh, to working with us. And I know a lot of people on this call will, will know uh, people like Christine Sager and Dr. Katie McLean. And they will be, they have been working with us to understand and improve the system. And it's been, it's been very, very worthwhile. Thermal Clean Limited has over 35 years in the oil and gas and geothermal business, um, bore managers, and they have added the mechanical expertise for us to perfect the system for you. So this was one of the, uh, this was one of the projects we took on and they identified it for us as a research project because silica still remained one of the major issues in their above ground plant and in their reinjection systems. Hydrofluoric acid use proved to be expensive, risky and unreliable. So this method that we've developed now can target silica, metal silicates, metal sulfides, calcite, barite and others. So let's have a talk about how this works and I'll show you the system that we use for it. First, it's carried out during full normal operation of your plant. You do not need to take a reinjection well out of service. It's a three step process and the chemical constituents and application are specific to the types of uh, deposits that you have. What we found, and this is another output of the uh, R&D department, is that just dosing one chemical all the time doesn't work. And what they found was that many of the silicates in particular form a hydrophobic coating on them. So that means the more chemical you put down, that doesn't mean that you get a better result because they become resistant or waterproof, if you like, hydrophobic to the chemicals. So it has been a, a combination of the type of chemicals, the frequency and 
concentration in which they're applied, and also the pressures and temperatures. What is the outcome? Well, in one company alone, as I mentioned at the beginning, there's been over $60 million of net savings in the last in the last 18 months. Now that is a significant step forward for this industry. Let's talk about how we do it. So what we do is we bolt onto the top of the wellhead a large injection lance and we pump the chemicals down through this into the flow of the well. And by doing this, we avoid any of the chemicals coming into direct contact with the well head or the valves at the head of the, of the well. The process is patented now because it is unique. It's, uh, it's relatively straightforward when you have people like TCL or your own uh, engineers on site and your bore managers able to uh, take the top off a well and inject this lance. I'll now talk a little bit about what chemicals we use. It's pumped in at full flow. Now I'm going to refer back now to what is the basic chemical premise on why this technique works. We saw at the beginning that that K2 of of a of silica deposits is 11, which means at pH 11, silica will redissolve. So we tried this back in 2015 at contact, and we found it didn't work. So we started the, the joint approach to understand why. The first reason why caustic alone does not work is that it doesn't dissolve silicates. Some silicates, yes, but other silicates, no. The second thing is that the caustic alone may dissolve the silica, but what it then does is makes the available soluble silica more uh, higher concentration to then react with cations. So we start to increase the deposition of silicates. The third reason why caustic alone does not work is that caustic and many brines will cause precipitation of other minerals, for example, calcium, for example, iron. So when they form and react, they, when they react with the caustic and form other deposits, this then effectively blocks your formation. So that, that's where we started to uh, think harder and put it into the R&D department of Selenus, who have come up with application techniques and other chemicals to avoid this happening. And the results speak for themselves. Let's talk now about some of the results. What we've noticed is that when we started doing it, we were, we were working on wells that already had some capacity and we were able to recover some of the capacity. Of course, we needed flow to take the chemicals into those cracks and fissures in the formation. But what we've been able to develop, and this is with the help of TCL and Contact Energy, is that we've just, we've created techniques to be able to cold stimulate a well to get some flow that we can then get the chemicals down. And as a result, we've been able to recover dead wells. So wells that are completely rendered useless, completely blocked in the formation, we've been able to recover them. The second discovery, particularly in the last eight months, is that we've developed ways of understanding what is the chemistry of the geology of the formation and stimulate that in a way that we're getting over 100% of the original capacity of these wells. Let's look at some examples. Now this graph here, you'll see two colored lines. You'll see a green line, that is flow, and you'll see a blue line, that is pressure. So this particular well, WK304, it's a contact energy. This is this information is also available in some papers that contact have written on uh, on their successes with this method. This well was dead. So we used the technique that uh, Thermal Clean Limited and contact that uh, developed to able to 
cold stimulate the well to get some flow. So we cold stim stimulated the, the well, we got some flow. As we changed back to the hot brine, we lost the flow again. So when we started to see losing the flow here, we started pumping in our chemicals, and this is the increase in capacity that we saw over one, two and a half days. In this particular case, the calculations that were done by the reservoir engineers said that the maximum capacity of this well at this well head pressure, so at this pumping pressure, which was 5.79 bar, the maximum we could get would be 130 tonnes per hour. What we achieved was 140 tonnes per hour. I'm going to come back to this well uh, and the next well to show another phenomenon that we learned doing this process. Here is WK310. Again, it was essentially dead. In fact, it was receiving very little. They took it off the grid because it wasn't helping to their production. Again, the in this case here, the um, the brown line is pressure and the blue line is flow. So we took the well from it was 16 tons per hour to 180 tons per hour. And that all happened again with the clean process online in two days. Once we started to understand the geology and started experimenting with how we can stimulate the geology of the formation, we did this well a year later. And what we took it from was it had declined after a year of operation to about 70 tonnes per hour, and we actually got to a flow of 271 tonnes per hour. Now, that was nearly double what the theoretical maximum capacity of this well was. So if you relate this to your plant, you have a well that is nearly dead. And what are the options? Well, we can try hydrochloric acid, we can try explosives, or we drill a new well. And that could cost anything between three and $10 million, depending on where the new well is and how much uh, pipe work is needed to connect it. So in this case, for under $200,000, this well was brought back not only to full capacity, but nearly double what its theoretical capacity was. So you can see what a gift this uh, new technique is to the industry. Here is an example of BR55. This, I have plenty of examples. I'm not going to go through uh, all of them today, but this was a well that again was down to 20 tonnes per hour. We did a clean and we got it up to about 150 tonnes per hour, and then it settled, it settled at this flow rate here, which is around, which is around 100 tonnes per hour, between 80 and 100 tonnes per hour. You can see, of course, the flow, which is the blue, changes with the wellhead pressure. So the higher the pressure, the higher the flow, lower pressure, lower flow. We did this clean, and in one day, this clean took one day, you'll see that the flow increased to 474 tonnes per hour, and the wellhead pressure dropped. So that's the significance that this method can have on some wells. As I said at the beginning, every well is different, so we will need to look at many, uh, many bits of data on the exact well. And my final slide is a comparison that, again, I, I need to thank Contact Energy for. They used to use hydrofluoric acid or mud acid to try and open up and clean some of their reinjection wells. This slide here is, is, two, is two different graphs put together. The well was pretty much dead. They used cold stimulation, they pumped a lot of cold water down there, they pumped a lot of hydrofluoric acid down there, and of course hydrofluoric acid needs to be in cold water because the hotter the acid, the more aggressive it is against the well casing. It's also very dangerous to deal with. 
So once they got past the cold stimulation result, you see the well started to drop in capacity very quickly. And at this point here, so at this point here, which is about 70 tonnes per hour, it was back to its normal capacity. And over the space of two months, the well dropped back to nothing. So as an experiment, Contact decided to use the online technique on the same well so they could compare the results. And here is what we have here. First, the capacity of the well went to 140 tonnes per hour. And you can see that the decline lasted, was not as steep, and the capacity of the well lasted over one year. In fact, once they did the numbers on it, they found that this method was 17, that's 17, not 70, but 17, 17 times more efficient than HF. It was 20% of the cost. And of course, it was much safer for the people doing the job and for the environment. Now, I've talked about geothermal reinjection wells, but the same technique we use in binary plants. So if you have deposits in binary plants that are iron sulfides, that are silicates, that are freshly formed silica, uh, metal sulfides like antimony sulfide, arsenic sulfide, we can use the same online technique for cleaning and improving the efficiency of the well. And here we have a, a binary plant, the economizer and the vaporizer here with a huge reduction in the back pressure. In fact, it was an 85% improvement. So here is where we're looking now about the, the, the system. The online, the online dosing system can be used in binary plants. It can be used in reinjection lines and it can be used in reinjection wells. And before I finish off, I have one more slide and I'm going to share this again. This is courtesy of Contact Energy Limited and this slide here refers to the increase in output of a well, a production well, that uh, was a relatively high enthalpy well. And because the formation was tight, and I know in Mexico they have a lot of these uh, wells where the permeability is not high in the production well, which means there's a lot of restriction to two phase or or single or vapor phase flow in the uh, in the production well. So that causes flashing in the formation. They had no way of cleaning the flashing, the deposits that were formed by the flashing in the formation. So basically this well died within 10 years of it first being drilled. Now, for those of you who understand reservoir engineering graphs uh, and this technology, you will make sense of this. But from a layman's perspective, what we can see here is here is the reinjection capacity of the well in various tests in 2011 and 2013. What happened is the pressure of the reservoir dropped and from 2015 on, the well scaled in the formation until on the 14th of December last year, it died. Now this was about an eight megawatt well. Now every country has different electricity prices, but rule of thumb, eight megawatts is about five to six million dollars worth of electricity. So we applied a very similar technique the well did have to be quenched. We can't do it online because we, we can't inject into the formation. We took the well offline for four days and recovered it from 14th of December back up to full capacity. The job took four days. The most recent reinjection uh, test was done on the 5th of May. And you can see here that it's actually higher than it has ever been in its, in its life. So when we step back with this technique, we can see that this new technique and chemistries and the way the chemistries have apl are applied are significant for the geothermal industry because now you have a way of recovering production capacity and reinjection capacity. 
in a way that is not using risky chemicals, does not need dosing over years or months, and in the case of reinjection wells, is pretty much instantaneous over the space of a few days. So thank you, you're probably very tired of my voice now. Um, I'm going to pass back to Andrew and uh, he can carry on with the uh, rest, with the rest of the uh, webinar. And I thank you very much for your time and patience listening to my Kiwi accent, which I hope you've been able to understand. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. Yeah, and here's yeah, another here's Kiwi another accent. accent. So, uh, thanks, <laughs> thanks, Logan. Uh, a very good presentation. Um, unfortunately, well, fortunately, which is the way you look at it, we, we've run a little long in time. Uh, we've only got about four minutes or so of our scheduled session left. Um, we're happy to keep the, the call going for another 10 or 15 minutes to, to take questions, um, but understand if uh, people need to, to drop off. So as I indicated at the start, um, if you do have any questions, could you please submit those through the meeting chat function? Um, and while you're submitting your questions, um, I'd just like to make you aware of some upcoming events and some product releases. So um, coming up next is our second uh, geothermal webinar, which will be on the 28th of July, and will feature the development work we've been doing in the area of deposit control and inhibition. So your local um, Salinas representative will be in touch with you on that shortly. Or if you like, you could be able to register directly from the uh, Salinas.com very shortly within the ne probably next week. Uh, also, Salinas will be presenting four technical papers at the World Geothermal Congress on the uh, 15th of June. Uh, these will be virtual presentations covering today's well cleaning topic along with both deposit and control, corrosion control in geothermal power applications. So please refer to, to, the, uh, to the link uh, highlighted there for inf more information and access to these technical uh, presentations. Uh, some really very good presentations and would strongly recommend that you, uh, that you sit in on those. And finally, uh, we're really excited to announce the release of a new geothermal mod deposit modeling software called the GSOL Performance Modeling Tool. This is a web-based application powered by the industry standard calculator watch um, that allows users to easily and accurately assess the likelihood of mineral scale formation in the geothermal production wells and surface equipment. A restricted uh, use version can be uh, accessed from the geothermal innovation page on salinas.com and we invite you all to, to give it a try and see what you think. Next slide, please. So we will uh, uh, go into some questions now. I see that we do have one question there, um, but uh, if we're not able to cover everyone's questions today, there's a couple of contacts down there. You can contact me at adine at salinas.com, or you can reach out to us um, via the inquiry um, option or function on salinas.com. So Logan, we do have a question here. So. How do you measure or model the treatment coverage in a well? Um, could this technique benefit from a well design with proper zonal isolation in a scenario with pre-existing preferential path rock channel? Okay, so this the short answer is yes. Now we looked at the ability or the possibility of plugging different zones of a well. But what we found is this isn't really necessary. What we found is that now there's two different cases here. OK, if we look at a reinjection well, it is more straightforward because some reinjection wells have inflows which will dilute the chemical and take and when that uh, inflow goes out to the feed zone, the chemical will be diluted. If we have PTS data, then we can account for this and budget for it. The other consideration with a reinjection well, if they if there are different feed zones, that these can be manipulated by the pressure in which we can pump the chemicals down. So if we use the standard pressure of the reinjection well, we can measure via a PTS uh, scan where that will go. And by changing that reinjection pressure, 
we can create a profile of where where the fluid will go under different pressures, under less pressure and under higher pressure. And that can help us stimulate different zones that are more blocked than others. Sometimes we don't need to use a PTS because the the cost effectiveness of this is really high. So if it means pumping down a bit more chemical than is absolutely necessary, it doesn't really cost that much more. And as you know, the cost of a PTS run, you know, can be in the, you know, 10,000 a day, for example. So that is a, that's an economic uh, question for the company. With production wells, though, it's slightly different. With the production well, we need to know where the feed zones are. We need to know once once the well is quenched, how those feed zones perform. Do they have inflows at higher or lower levels? Do at higher pressures or higher flows, water goes into zones that are not actually a production feed zone? So in the case of production wells, if it is a complicated well, and we've just done a complicated well uh, just a, a few months ago, it actually had nine different feed zones. Once the well was quenched, the first feed zone became a very high inflow. So what we did is we adjusted our application pressure and we adjusted the application flow, of course, because the flow and the pressure is related. Um, we were able to adjust the chemical concentration so that we knew the chemicals were getting to the target feed zones. So short answer is in reinjection, you're pretty safe. If you have bore logs and PTS data, that is always helpful. In the case of production wells, I do suggest in wells that have um, more than one or two defined feed zones. And again, it's going to depend on the geology and the permeability and the, the size of those feed zones. A PTS survey is always welcome. Thank you for the question. Really good question. Thanks, Logan. At, at this stage, um, we don't have any additional questions. So I'm assuming that we can conclude the call. I'll just wait another couple of seconds. No, no, no further questions. So um, thanks everybody. And that concludes today's seminar. Again, if you want to reach out to us on today's topic or any other areas you think Selenus might be able to support, please either email me at uh, adine at selenus.com, which is shown there on your screen at the moment, or send an inquiry through um, selenus.com and we'll be very excited to, to talk with you. So thank you again for your time, and we hope the information imparted has uh, been beneficial, and depending on your time zone, a very good morning or good afternoon, and we're looking forward to speaking again on our second seminar on the 28th of July. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>